Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am Tim Huxley, the Executive Director of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, Asia, here in Singapore. I'm delighted uh, this evening to be able to introduce the Right Honourable William Hague, the British government's first Secretary of State and Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, who will present the second IISS Fullerton Lecture on the theme of Britain in Asia. This lecture and the others in the series are supported by the Fullerton Hotels Group, and we're extremely happy that we are able to stage these lectures in this historical landmark building. This was formerly Singapore's general post office, and I'm old enough to remember coming here to buy stamps and to post letters many years ago. I'm also old enough to remember when Mr. Haig first came to political prominence. This was in 1977, when, as a long-haired 16-year-old, <laughs> he, he spoke at the Conservative Party's annual national conference. And I should add that we all had long hair in those days. William Hague's career in national politics began in earnest in 1989 when he was elected to Parliament as the youngest Conservative MP at the time. He quickly became part of the government and he joined the Cabinet in 1995 as Secretary of State for Wales. Following the Conservatives' defeat in the 1997 elections, Mr Hague was elected leader of the Conservative Party Moving to the back benches in 2001, he became active as a media personality and also distinguished himself as a political biographer with books on the 18th century British Prime Minister William Pitt and also on the anti-slave trade activist William Wilberforce. In December 2005, Mr. Haig returned to the Shadow Cabinet as David Cameron's Shadow Foreign Secretary on the election of the Conservative Liberal Democrat Coalition Government in May 2010, he was appointed to his present post. Over the last two years, as Foreign Secretary, he has stressed that the UK has a foreign policy with a conscience. He's maintained an emphasis on human rights and overseas aid and development, amongst other key features of Britain's foreign policy. He has led British foreign policy on particularly testing issues, especially in relation to the Middle East, where the UK was a leading actor in last year's international effort to protect Libya's people against the Gaddafi regime. And turning to this region, in January, he became the first British Foreign Secretary to visit Burma for more than half a century. I know, Secretary of State, that you have some important things to say this evening about British interests and British policy in Asia, and we look forward to hearing them. But before we hear your address, uh, I should mention that you have kindly agreed to take questions for 20 minutes or so afterwards. And while some of those questions uh, will come, as it were, live from the audience here at the Fullerton, you have also agreed to take questions uh, via Twitter. Uh, people watching the, the live feed of your address, and indeed Twitter users with mobile devices in this room can send their questions to me via the hashtag IISS underscore Asia. I can't promise that I will pose to the Secretary of State all the Twitter questions, but I certainly hope to use some of them. Secretary of State, the floor is yours. Uh, well, Tim, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for that introduction, reminding uh, everybody of when you and I used to have a lot more hair. Uh, but as my father always tells me, grass does not grow on a busy street. And so we have that, we have that thought to comfort us. Uh, and it is a great pleasure to be here in Singapore, a country I have long admired as a... quite early on in the speech to change the water, but there we are. <laughs> a country I have long uh, admired as a beacon of uh, free trade, 
and economic openness, a model of constructive foreign policy, and of course an old and valued friend to the United Kingdom. And what a great honor it is that a former president of Singapore is here with us uh, tonight, which I'm delighted to see. And this morning I went for a run around your botanic gardens, uh, where I was delighted to learn there grows a very special orchid, named in honor of another great admirer of Singapore, our famously strong and decisive conservative Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, who visited here in 1985. As someone who was her most junior member of Parliament in 1989, I can only imagine what it was like for the person who had to tell her that since orchids don't come in the conservative color blue, the flower named after her for all perpetuity is Labour Red. But someone, <laughs> someone had to tell her that. <laughs> I've come here after visiting Vietnam and hard on the heels of today's British Prime Minister, David Cameron, who visited here just two weeks ago. And I'm here as he was to strengthen our relationship with Singapore and with the region and to have serious discussions about the major challenges of our time, how we build a sustainable global economy, how we enlarge free trade and combat protectionism, and how we defend our common security. And I'm also here to talk business, to champion British companies looking to invest in Singapore, to urge their Singaporean counterparts to do the same in Britain. I've been talking business as well in Hanoi yesterday and will do again tomorrow in Brunei. And with less than 90 days to go before we host the Olympic Games in London, it's also a pleasure to recall that moment seven years ago when we were awarded the Games at a ceremony here in Singapore. And in the year of Her Majesty the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, I'm delighted that their Royal Highnesses, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, will be visiting soon to celebrate our ties through the Commonwealth. As all these things show, the relationship between our countries is rich and it is deep. <clears throat> I'm grateful to the IISS for giving me the opportunity to give the second Fullerton Lecture today on the subject of Britain in Asia. That, of course, is an immensely broad canvas, but I will unroll it wider still during the course of my remarks, since I can't speak about Britain in Asia without talking about our approach to foreign policy across the world. And my message today in Asia is that those who might think that British engagement with Asia is a thing of the past or that we will become a partner of declining relevance could not be more wrong. Today, Britain is looking east as never before. We are setting our country firmly on the path to far closer ties with countries across Asia over the next 20 years and on a completely new footing compared to the past. Mine is the first generation in Britain that cannot remember the days of empire, with the exception of the handover of Hong Kong, which I attended. In all other respects, someone like me has no recollection of an earlier time, as I was a small child when countries like Malaysia and Singapore were gaining their independence. Today, our leaders and our people approach Asia in a wholly different spirit to the past, with a sense of equal partnership, mutual respect, and the desire to see opportunity and development for all. We understand the immense potential of a peaceful and stable Asia made up of thriving and open economies. And we welcome the prospect of a rich and strong Asia with an equally strong and growing role in world affairs. Asia's rise is good for the world, bringing millions out of poverty, providing new opportunities for global trade and investment, and helping to guard against global security threats. We want Britain to be a leading partner with Asian countries in developing that prosperous future, in trade and commerce, in culture, education and development, and in foreign policy and security. Our government will invest the time and effort to develop the political relationships and deep understanding to support this vision over the long term. Those countries in the region that choose to look to Britain will find a willing, active and serious partner for the 21st century. We know that we're not alone in this new focus on Asia. At a time when the United States is shifting its focus towards the region and we wish to see the European Union take a more active role, there is a great deal for us to work on with them and many areas where we can align our efforts. We're living, of course, through a turbulent period in world affairs. Economic crises have put the global economy under strain and are accelerating the reordering of the political landscape. The emergence of new powers means that the international order is in flux, as it is in your region. 
It is a more complicated international landscape with many more centers of decision-making than in the past, and our diplomacy needs to reflect that if we are to narrow these differences. Our world is not settling into blocks that require nations to choose between East and West or retreat behind ideological boundaries. There is far greater scope for flexible relationships that cut across geography, religion and political orientation. And this is a change that we embrace in Britain. And on top of this, the whole context in which governments conduct foreign policy is being transformed by the connective force of the internet, satellite television and mobile phone technology, as we are seeing with questions from Twitter this evening, all of which are putting more power into the hands of citizens rather than governments and fueling movements for change such as those sweeping the Middle East and North Africa today. All these changes mean that our world is becoming increasingly interdependent, Conflict or organized crime in one part of the world undermines the prosperity and security of all, while climate change is a threat to the very existence of us all. None of these problems can be addressed through anything other than through global multilateral efforts, and no country holds a monopoly on the solutions to them. Our foreign policy cooperation already reflects that trend. And I welcome Asia-Pacific countries' contribution to military operations in Afghanistan, to development assistance to Pakistan and Afghanistan, to UN peacekeeping, and to naval counter-piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden. But there is more that we can do to forge a more effective and stable world order. Too often in the past, there's been a tendency to overlook smaller nations in favor of the large, but one of the striking features of our networked world now is the ability of small states to influence the course of world affairs in new ways. Countries like Qatar and the United Arab Emirates played an absolutely pivotal role in our international response to Libya and are vital partners on a range of issues, including our efforts in Somalia and Yemen. And Singapore, placed as it is between the Indian and Pacific Oceans, a true hub at the very center of the fastest growing economies on the planet, has a very valuable role to play. Indeed, one of the lasting legacies of the founders of independent Singapore is that not only did they build a dynamic and thriving country from uncertain beginnings, but also one that is extremely well equipped for the 21st century. Openness to ideas, enterprise and innovation, cultural soft power, and an ability to work cooperatively with other states are among the greatest attributes for success in today's world, and Singapore has these in abundance. In this new global environment, we know that Britain's national interest requires us to be outward-looking and diplomatically active as never before. Britain's presence here in Singapore is already considerable and growing 32,000 people and some 700 companies. Many of them make significant contributions, whether it be Arab engineering and the iconic Marina Bay Sands Hotel, or Rolls-Royce opening their state-of-the-art campus at Salita. <clears throat> we must connect our country with new opportunities like this in the fastest growing parts of the world, looking for new allies in foreign policy, as well as new markets for trade and investment. Our foreign policy must be truly global in reach and in outlook, and we must foster strong ties with individual countries, as well as maintain a vigorous role in multilateral organizations. We know that in a region as diverse as Asia, there is no substitute for a deep understanding of individual nations and for relationships that take into account their particular history, culture, and perspective. Every country is different, of course, and there can be no one-size-fits-all approach to your region or indeed to any other. So we have set out systematically to intensify Britain's economic and political connections with the new powers of the 21st century in Latin America, in Africa, in the Gulf, and here in the Asia-Pacific region, where the greatest numbers of the world's emerging powers and fastest-growing economies are to be found. Of the 29 countries we have identified for these efforts, 11 are in Asia. And we have put the need to turbocharge our economic and political ties with them among the very top priorities of our foreign policy. Asia is the engine of the world's growth today, and we want to be part of that success story. In some respects, we already are, and British exports to the Asia-Pacific region are up 20% year on year. But we need to do more. Creating jobs and growth in our economy like any other will depend overwhelmingly on expanding trade and investment. 
And we know that much of the opportunity for that lies in the vast markets of this region. So we have set ambitious targets to increase and in some cases to double our bilateral trade with China, India, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia and South Korea within the next five years as part of a target to double British exports to one trillion pounds a year by the year 2020. We've significantly increased Britain's diplomatic engagement across your region over the last two years, something you may have noticed in Singapore, uh, where you've had something of a blitz of senior British visitors, including our Prime Minister, our Education Secretary, Defence Secretary, Business Secretary, the Duke of York and our Foreign Office Minister responsible for Asia. And we're one of the few Western countries to be expanding its diplomatic network at a time of economic crisis. We're doing this in more than 20 countries around the world, but by far the largest focus of this diplomatic expansion is in Asia. We hope to open up to eight new British diplomatic posts in Asia by 2015, and we're currently discussing this with the governments in question. Separately, by 2015, we will have deployed around 60 extra diplomatic staff to China, 30 to India, another 50 across our Asian network in Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, Burma, Singapore, Cambodia, Brunei, North and South Korea, and Mongolia. We are properly equipping these diplomats, for example, by increasing the number of our diplomats who speak Chinese by 40%. As a further sign of the importance we attach to British diplomacy in Asia, I have announced today that we intend to reopen the British Embassy in Laos that was closed in 1985. Not only will we have an ambassador and embassy that there for the first time in 27 years and be able to build a stronger bilateral relationship, but we will there also then be represented in each and every ASEAN member state. We're deliberately doing this ahead of the culmination of plans to transform ASEAN into a single market and production base that is highly competitive and fully integrated into the global community by 2015 to the great benefit of the 600 million people who live in ASEAN countries. These extra posts and diplomats are the physical proof of our desire for broad and deep partnerships with Asian countries for the 21st century. We want to build on our natural alliances with Australia and New Zealand our web of historic partnerships through the Commonwealth, and our long-standing and invaluable ties with Japan. This includes intensifying our historic ties with India as it grows in size, wealth and influence. India's rise presents enormous opportunities, whether through the mutual benefits of increased trade and investment or through its increasing responsibility in the field of international security. We also want to continue to develop a strong and open partnership with China. Our shared interests outweigh our differences, and they are growing all the time. This requires us to seize opportunities together while being frank about differences. This is not about containing China. The world needs China to continue healthy and sustainable growth. Just as we do not see a zero-sum game in foreign affairs, we don't see one in the world economy. We want China to succeed and to play a more active leadership role in addressing global issues. We will continue to argue for European economic openness to China, just as we will argue for China's continued economic opening to the outside world. We're confident that Britain brings a great deal to these and other partnerships in the region. Our economy has strengths that are relevant to the most developed economies, as well as those still developing, ranging from our world-leading services in education, high-tech manufacturing, low-carbon technologies, the creative industries, life sciences, finance, insurance, banking and accountancy, to our expertise in urban development. We are the country that is the most open to investment in the whole of Europe. To take just one example, 1,200 Japanese companies provide jobs for 130,000 people in Britain, and new investments keep coming in. Our ambition is to make Britain the home of Asian investment and Asian finance in Europe. And we are backing this with steps to make our tax system the most competitive in the G20. We also want Asian businesses to look to British companies as investment partners in projects in China and elsewhere. Across the board, in international organizations, we champion change and values that mat matter to many countries in this region. In the G8, G20 and IMF, Britain is an insistent voice in favor of free, global and open markets, calling for nations to resist protectionist impulses and press forward on trade liberalization. 
We support strong global financial institutions that enforce a truly global approach to financial regulation, leading to a more balanced, sustainable economy in which global finance is a force for good rather than a source of instability. At the United Nations, we advocate an expanded Security Council, including permanent seats for Japan and for India, and we understand the need to work more closely on foreign policy with the emerging powers. In the Commonwealth, one of the most significant business and cultural networks of the 21st century, we urge reform to help unlock its full human and economic potential and make it a more effective advocate of its democratic values. And in the European Union, we are the leading advocate of lower trade barriers, the completion of the single market, and of enlargement. We were at the forefront of efforts to secure preferential trading arrangements for Pakistan after its devastating floods, and are passionately in favor of ambitious free trade agreements with the Asia-Pacific region. We want to see a free trade agreement concluded with Singapore this year, building on the success of the recent EU-Korea free trade agreement. And we want to see momentum on agreements with Japan, India, Vietnam, and Malaysia. This is a priority for our diplomats in posts in these countries. Britain will always be one of the nations that support the effective use of the European Union's collective weight in foreign policy. Tomorrow I will be attending the meeting of EU and ASEAN foreign ministers in Brunei. Uh, we believe that it is time for the EU to be more vigorously and coherently engaged with countries of the Asia-Pacific region, within the limits of its competences, working to break down market barriers within Europe and between Europe and the rest of the world, championing free trade agreements, and working closely together in specialist areas such as preparedness for disasters. This also involves being active on foreign policy issues in Asia, for example, offering European expertise to support regional integration in Southeast Asia and taking a robust position on North Korean nuclear and missile proliferation. We will champion a long-term and coherent EU approach in the years ahead while not detracting for one instant from our own distinctive British foreign policy and enhanced relations in the region. A case in point is Burma, uh, to give it the name uh, that Aung San Suu Kyi herself uses. There we have used our historic bilateral connections and our active role in Europe to good effect to support the people of that country. When we look at the remarkable changes finally taking place in Burma after so many years, we're proud that we never wavered in our support for democracy and that we insisted on real political and human rights reform as the condition for any move towards an open relationship between Burma and the European Union. We're delighted that we're starting to see that reform. We still have concerns about Burma's ethnic conflicts and about human rights, including remaining political prisoners. But we welcome the boldness shown by the President of Burma and by Do Aung San Suu Kyi herself, which has finally placed the country on a hopeful path as well as the efforts by several ASEAN members over many years. And it will be a huge honor if she, Aung San Suu Kyi, can visit Britain this summer for the first time in 24 years on her first visit outside the country. I visited Burma in January, as you heard, and our Prime Minister was the first Western head of government to visit after the recent by-elections. Based on what we saw and heard, we led the way in calling for the suspension of EU sanctions, which was agreed in Luxembourg this week. Today, after discussion with Aung San Suu Kyi and very careful consideration, I'm announcing that the British government will lift its policy of discouraging trade with Burma. We believe that now the right kind of responsible trade and investment can help aid that country's transition. We will put responsible investment at the heart of our future commercial relationship with Burma, encouraging investment that will benefit local communities and respect the local environment. And we look to partners such as Singapore to support this approach. To achieve this, we will aim to launch investment climate assessments for Burma with the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. We will also fund programs to bolster the rule of law and to plan how the UN's guiding principles on business and human rights might be put in place and take forward work on how investment might contribute to growth that particularly helps poorer people. We're also in discussion with the Burmese authorities about opening a new diplomatic office in Naypyidaw. As Burma illustrates, our approach to the Asia-Pacific is far wider than trade and commerce. 
Important, of course, though those things are. It embraces the promotion of values that support democracy and prosperity and which have been at the heart of the remarkable journey taken by Indonesia, among other countries in the region, and which are increasingly part of the discourse in ASEAN. And it reflects the reality of a world in which our security is increasingly indivisible. Whether it is the need for peaceful, peaceful agreement over the South China Sea, which carries up to half of all world trade, or for effective action to combat extremism and terrorism, our security and prosperity are intertwined with yours. We are a country that has never shirked its international security responsibilities, from our role in NATO to the five power defense arrangements which have now entered their 41st year. We're one of the few countries in the world that is willing and capable to deploy military force to address threats to human life or to security, as we did again so recently in Libya. We are not a significant military power in Asia, of course, but our role in NATO, in the five power defense arrangements, and our defense expertise as a nation mean that we have a role to play. This includes the military dialogues we're building with countries like China and Vietnam, which is another valuable aspect of our diplomacy in the region. We're full of praise for the way ASEAN, by providing defense guarantees between its member states and forging harmony from diversity, is already contributing to regional and global security and stability. Our wish to accede to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation reflects our desire to see an even stronger ASEAN in the future and to strengthen our cooperation on issues that affect security in the Asia-Pacific. We cooperate constantly with countries in Southeast Asia on global counter-terrorism threats, helping to disrupt and deter terrorist activities, an area where Britain has unique skills and capabilities. We help disrupt narcotics trafficking and nuclear weapons proliferation and have worked closely with Asian partners to try to stop the spread of nuclear weapons, particularly in the Middle East. We look forward to the signing of the P5 protocol to the Southeast Asia nuclear-free weapons zones this year, which will bring the number of non-nuclear states against which the UK has promised that it will not use or threaten to use its nuclear weapons to nearly 100. After Indonesia's ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, we are much closer to seeing it come into force. And Britain will redouble its efforts to support that, as well as a fissile material cut-off treaty. Additionally, we work closely with Singapore and other ASEAN powers on tackling piracy, from the Malacca Strait to the Indian Ocean and the Gulf of Aden, an 18th century problem that in the 21st century has the ability to disrupt global trade and which thrives where states fail to join up their diplomatic and security efforts. Last year, we held the first high-level intergovernmental conference on threats and opportunities in cyberspace, which is producing not only an emerging threat to global commerce, but also new opportunities for technically, technologically advanced countries like Singapore and the United Kingdom, which lead in cutting-edge technology. Asia has over a billion internet users, an increase of nearly 800% over the last 10 years, and more than Europe and the Americas combined. So I welcome the fact that South Korea will hold will host a follow-on conference to the one we held in London uh, in 2013. No country can wall itself off from the risks of cybercrime or cyber attack, and we must all work together against this threat. But it's equally important that in taking steps to protect our citizens from harm, we don't undermine the fundamental human rights and freedoms which apply as much online as they do in any other area of life. Elsewhere in the region, we are working in support of President Aquino's efforts to resolve tensions in the Philippines through the Mindanao peace process, along with Malaysia, Brunei, and other international partners. And I very much welcome the progress which the latest round of peace talks made earlier this week in Kuala Lumpur. And we're offering UK expertise to support the ASEAN Working Group on Climate Change and commendable projects such as the Heart of Borneo Initiative on Sustainable Forestry. As all these issues show, long-term engagement with Asia is viewed by us not as an option but as an imperative. It is central to our foreign policy objectives and will become more so over time. And I believe it's also in the interests of countries in the region. If together we and our partners are able to continue down this path of stronger cooperation, then I believe we can look forward confidently uh, to our future relations. One in which 
uh, in this region. Its major powers are working in partnership uh, with European countries and with the United States and with other partners around the world to help build a stronger rules-based international system in which conflict becomes unthinkable and territorial disputes have been resolved, in which nuclear proliferation is rolled back, poverty alleviated, and sustainable growth ensured. By any account, Singapore will no doubt make its mark on this in the coming years. You have shown time and again your ability to transform and reinvent the basis of your success and to maintain your openness at the same time. Your values of resilience, hard work and determination make you a valuable partner as well as a successful nation. In 1819, Raffles wrote of Singapore, here is all life and activity and it would be difficult to name a place on the face of the globe with brighter prospects. Well, how right he proved to be. So in this hub of ideas and enterprise and at a time of change in world affairs, I can confidently assert that far from turning away from your region, Britain has embarked on an entirely new effort to enhance our ties across the region. We will be a consistent partner over the coming years, respecting diversity, working with the grain of the region, listening to advice from those who know it best, and building mutually beneficial and deep relationships in trade, security, and diplomacy. We don't take our ties for granted or think for a moment that we can trade on history to get a free pass. So in all the areas I have described, in Singapore and across the Asia Pacific, we hope to turn our shared heritage, values, and interests into common purpose, and more importantly, into common action. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary of State, for that powerful address. Uh, I think you concisely, but also comprehensively, um, highlighted that the, United, that, that the United Kingdom has significant economic and strategic interests in Asia. It has important sets of relations with Asian states and most importantly, is actively engaged in further expanding and deepening these relationships in the economic sphere, of course, but also in the security realm. And I think for us at the IISS, um, the, the last part of your address uh, relating to the security theme was uh, particularly valuable. Uh, I know that members of our audience uh, this evening will be keen to pose you a, a, a range of difficult questions uh, and thank you for agreeing to respond to these. Uh, while you were speaking, we were also receiving a number of questions via, via Twitter and uh, in, a, in a little while I will select some of those uh, for you to respond to as well. But to start off with, I will turn to our audience in the room and ask any questions. Sir, in the middle here. Yes, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Hay, uh, what is view wait, of the... Wait for the microphone. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, and, and if you could also please uh, say who you are and <coughs> what your affiliation is. Uh, uh, my name is Alan Coleman. I work at ASTAR. I'm a biomedical researcher. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Haig about his views on the uh, ongoing territorial dispute that's going on in the South China Sea and how he sees that unfolding in the coming months. Mm -hmm. Well, um, this is, I mentioned it briefly in my um, speech, so I can only expand on that a, um, a little bit. Um, this is something of, uh, that is, of course, of concern to all trading nations in the world. Uh, freedom of navigation in the South China Sea is very, very important. Um, and it is, uh, I think I mentioned in my speech that um, at times nearly half of world trade goes through the South China Sea. So it is something we watch very closely and that other major trading nations will watch very closely. Um, we look to the nation's concern to manage peacefully and hopefully resolve uh, peacefully 
uh, the disputes in that region and to do so in accordance with international law. And uh, that is, that's our position, it's the position of uh, European nations and I think of most of the world. That doesn't mean we take sides on individual aspects of, that, of those uh, disputes, but that is the uh, approach as a permanent member of the UN Security Council uh, that we will support. Simon Tay. Thank you. Um, welcome to Singapore, Secretary Haig. I'm Simon Tay. I'm the chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. Uh, my question relates to the broad ambition you've mentioned, but the question of the European and domestic crisis. Um, how much political will is there beyond your office in terms of the broader British public um, in two areas? Uh, one. In the free trade area, you know, uh, when things are looking bad at home, openness is hard to preach. And uh, there have been many obstacles to the EU ASEAN FTA, uh, which you've touched on. How do we overcome that? Um, secondly, uh, in terms of security, uh, and the number of issues you've touched on, uh, it seems to me inevitable that there will be some limitation on the security assets that Britain and other Europeans can put in the region. How do you intend to not just maintain, but increase your engagement on this front when your assets will be limited. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, the, there's huge political will in, ter in Britain in terms of um, free trade and openness. Um, we have, a, a, again, as I mentioned, the, I think what we can rightly claim is the most open economy in Europe. Uh, we are used to that. Um, we, we would not think of approaching our economic affairs in any other way. Uh, we are part of the single market in uh, the European Union. But we're also used to a relationship with the United States of America, for instance, where a million people work for American companies uh, in uh, Britain, and a million people in America work for British companies. Um, and we are the biggest investors uh, in each other's economies, between the United Kingdom and the United States. Uh, so for us, an open economy, even if you just look at our relationships in Europe and uh, <clears throat> North America, is of fundamental importance to us. Um, there are differences of um, emphasis, differences of degree among European nations on this, of course. Um, I mentioned how in looking for uh, uh, better trade access of Pakistan to European markets, we've really had to fight, actually. The Britain has been at the forefront of that. Uh, but we have really had to uh, argue very strongly and for a very long time within the EU to bring that about. Um, but one of the purposes of the European Union is to promote not only uh, free trade and a single market within its own boundaries, uh, but to do so with the rest of the world. So there'd be no resiling from that from Britain or from uh, the great majority, I think, of Europeans. We can conclude other free trade um, agreements. I've discussed it with your Prime Minister earlier today um, and, and with other ministers in the, in the Singapore government. Um, and while there are some remaining issues, um, nobody thinks they are insuperable issues uh, in concluding a, an EU Singapore uh, FTA. And then we can, um, that helps to go on to the wider relationship with, with ASEAN. Uh, so I think we, we're confident we can do those things. And we must remind everybody, all of us have a duty who believe in open economies, to, to win the argument, to, to um, intellectually win the argument at a time where, of course, protectionist instincts will arise. Um, that the, the income of all nations is raised by trade. Um, on the security side, um, one of my points really is that security cooperation is no longer just about physical assets. Uh, you're right, the, the United Kingdom's physical defense assets are mainly to be found elsewhere, not in Asia. Um, but on issues such as um, cybercrime uh, that I mentioned, or cyber attacks, uh, we are one of the leading nations in the world <clears throat> at how to, uh, and, and we are investing even at a time of a difficult defense uh, review, uh, we are investing an extra 650 million pounds over the next four years in our cyber capabilities. Uh, and that is something on which we need to work with other countries that also have a technological edge. Um, I think we're not far from the time where countries that cannot protect themselves and help protect their key industries 
against cyber attack will be at a serious competitive disadvantage in the world. And uh, Britain is at the forefront of those capabilities. Um, security is also about cooperating on other uh, issues in, in law enforcement. Um, I mentioned about combating narcotics, trafficking. Um, with um, ministers in Vietnam yesterday, I was discussing our work together uh, to uh, combat the trafficking of human beings, uh, to deal with organized crime uh, together. So there are very many aspects to security, and that's without even going into all the international treaties that I uh, spoke about before. Um, and therefore, um, in this networked world, it's about a lot more than physical assets. Sorry, that's a very long answer. But it was a very interesting question. Sir. Good evening, Secretary of State. My name is Roy, and I write for the Huffington Post. Um, British Prime Minister David Cameron was in Asia a couple of weeks ago selling British defense equipment to Indonesia in what Mr. Cameron described as selling the best defense equipment to one of the world's most important democracies. Uh, we are already living in turbulent times, as you said. Um, my question is, why does Britain want to play a role in an arms race in Asia now, especially in the Chinese backyard, considering the fact that Britain receives the maximum Chinese investment in the entire European Union? And two, was it really that easy for British Prime Minister to condone the fact that Indonesia used British Hawk jets to bomb civilians in East Timor? Well, thank you for that nice, friendly question. <laughs> uh, always get them from journalists. It's um, very helpful. Um, countries have a right to defend themselves. Uh, democracies have that right, as other can do, to uh, defend themselves. And... Um, there is nothing wrong in principle with a, with a country that has enormous expertise, as we do in uh, aerospace, uh, for instance. We are, our aerospace industry is one of the uh, leading such industries in the world uh, in trading in that technology with, with other nations. Um, and we have perhaps the most rigorous, certainly one of the most rigorous systems for scrutiny of arms exports of any country in the world. Working with the rest of the EU, we have uh, European and national consolidated criteria uh, for arms export controls, uh, very clear requirements uh, that we don't export arms where we believe there is a risk they would contribute to regional tensions or to internal repression. Those assessments have to be kept up to date, of course. They do change uh, over time. Uh, which means references to historical events do not always determine uh, what we are doing today. Um, so um, I think it, it's entirely right and appropriate to have, uh, to have that trade. Uh, and indeed, uh, other leading nations in the world do so as well. But it's right to subject it to the most rigorous standards, the highest uh, standards. And I would encourage other nations to adopt standards uh, in line with ours. And I do believe that Indonesia is a uh, remarkable democracy, uh, and it's one of the countries with which we have the closer ties that I've described. Good evening. My name is Corinne, and I'm from Tangan Trust School. Uh, I would like to ask the Secretary of State about the UK trade priorities and whether they were directed towards the more traditional view towards the EU or uh, towards the new Asian emerging markets? Thank you. Well, these are not mutually exclusive um, things. Um, uh, the, more of our exports are to, the, are to European countries than to anywhere else. But of course, as a proportion, that is starting to decline just because of the pattern of economic growth in the world. Uh, on the whole, European economies are flat at the moment in terms of growth. Uh, whereas there is a, a lot of growth elsewhere. And it's because we are directing increased attention to those rapidly growing markets that British exports are growing. In fact, Britain exported £50 billion more of goods in 2011, goods and services, than in 2010. Uh, so uh, that is um, very substantial growth. And, of course, that growth comes predominantly from outside Europe. Um, so, but these are not, um, we're not doing one to the exclusion uh, of the other. Uh, uh, we will remain a very important uh, 
uh, nation within the European single market, and we will, we will advocate very strongly policies within the European Union which encourage growth in Europe. Uh, and that means uh, changes to tax systems and regulatory systems that encourage businesses to grow. Uh, it means completing the single market within Europe as well as promoting free trade agreements uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, so we're, not, we're in no way... Um, taking our eye away from the importance of the European economies to us and the importance um, to the world of them succeeding in future years. But we are additionally uh, making the effort that I have described in the Asia-Pacific region, in Latin America, in parts of Africa. Six of the ten fastest-growing economies in the world are in Africa. Uh, we are additionally making that effort on top of the uh, effort that we put in uh, in Europe. Dr. Ewan Graham. Thank you, Foreign Secretary. Um, I work for the Rajaratnam School of International Studies here, a think tank in Singapore. Um, but to be fair, I should also disclose a former affiliation. I worked for the Foreign Office until 2010. Um, at that stage, the emerging powers work was beginning to take off. And it's, I take heart that some flesh has been put on those bones certainly in terms of the frontline reinforcement that you talked about, the extra um, linguists, the opening up of a, uh, a mission that was closed here in, in ASEAN. I think all of that is, is welcome and to be applauded. Um, my question really is perhaps wandering off from your, your, your brief, strictly speaking, but if this engagement between the UK and Asia is to be sustained, is there also a, a, a domestic lacunae, an element that needs to be addressed here in terms of the knowledge, the academic uh, capacity within the UK that delivers that knowledge uh, across the board, the economic, the politics, the security side, um, which frankly I, I've seen um, professionally and, and personally um, is, is often lacking. Um, we tend to think uh, of China first or India first uh, and Southeast Asia has uh, I think offered, suffered in between. Um, as I said, I know this may not, strictly speaking, be your brief, but um, would welcome your ideas if you think on, if, if, you, rec if you accept the premise, uh, and if you do, how that might be uh, addressed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So you left the Foreign Office in 2010, which is when I arrived there. <laughs> uh, I, uh, yes, good. I'm glad to hear there was no connection between these two uh, <laughs> events. Um, and, um, yeah, and you've uh, mentioned the points about the, the expansion of our diplomatic presence, and you're asking about um, the intellectual and academic capability, the capacity uh, that um, goes with that. That is important. It's, um, it's not something, of course, that governments can direct or control, almost by definition. It wouldn't be a very useful uh, such capacity if it was uh, uh, directed or, or just conjured into being by us. Uh, but it's certainly a very important goal for me to make the British Foreign Office itself a center of excellence uh, in diplomacy. In fact, we are running a program at the moment called Diplomatic Excellence uh, to be the best in everything that we do uh, throughout our diplomacy. And I believe that if a, if a foreign ministry is like that and is known for that, um, then it does create in its capital city, it helps to uh, foster from the people who leave that, from the people who aspire to join it. It helps to foster a, uh, a community of thinking, something I'm also setting about by making much more use of the alumni of our foreign office. Uh, and I invite them back. I've created what I call the Locarno Group. Distinguished ambassadors come back to give me their advice, so I'm not just listening to today's ambassadors. Uh, very good, though, they are. Um, and um, my, my vision is that uh, you never really leave a network. This is a network world. The uh, Foreign Office should be at the center of a network of thinking, of creativity, of problem solving. So I hope by doing that over time, uh, that will help to generate in the United Kingdom and more and contribute globally to uh, foreign policy uh, capacity and, and thinking. Uh, but we're, we are lucky, uh, in any case, in London to have excellent institutions such as the IISS, uh, of which I'm a member myself, um, and others, which I would like to mention but won't on a platform thank, thank of the IISS. I appreciate that. Uh, S. But there are others as well. Mm. And more are welcome. Mm. Thank you very much, Secretary of State. Um, 
I've had quite a few questions coming in via Twitter, mm -hmm. and in the few minutes that are, are left um, in this session, I, I would like to pose some of those to you. First of all, my, my colleague, uh, Adam Ward, at the IISS in, in London, who's director of studies there, asks about the, the five power defense arrangements and whether the UK has any new ideas about how to um, expand and en enhance its role in, in the FPDA? Well, we're maintaining it. The, the, um, it's a um, living organization. The Defense Secretary uh, was in the region a few months ago to take part uh, in the talks of the Five Power Defense Arrangement. It is a, um, uh, in its modern form now, 41 years on, it is as much a uh, political statement as a uh, physical set of uh, uh, arrangements. But I think that is good in any case. Uh, it's very important to continue it in that uh, form. But I'll let the Defence Secretary talk about uh, any detailed proposals for its future. Mm -hmm. The next question is from someone with the uh, hashtag Bean Cook, who I think is Alistair Cook, who's in this room. And he asks, Has there been, have there been any developments with respect to the, the UK role in helping national reconciliation in Burma? Well, there have been a lot of developments in, um, uh, in Burma. I, I, hope, I, I do strongly believe we've played a um, helpful role. We have remained for many years the largest aid donor to the people of Burma, uh, to the people, not to the government uh, of Burma. Um, and we've maintained a strong embassy there. We've maintained not only diplomatic relations with the government through very difficult times, but uh, uh, close relations with opposition figures, of course, including Aung San Suu Kyi, who I've mentioned uh, several times. Um, and we've been very clear about what we believe the Burmese authorities should do in return for what we have just been announcing. Um, when I was there in January, I asked them to release more political prisoners, to have free and fair elections in the by-elections, and to address the ethnic conflicts, which is, uh, Key. this is, I think it probably is what the question is directed at, on national reconciliation. Um, and I met many of the um, representatives of the ethnic groups uh, when I was there. I'm pleased that and, and I don't know how much this has resulted from the uh, pressure that we and other countries uh, have uh, applied, uh, but in recent, over recent months, ceasefires have been declared um, or negotiated in all but one of the ethnic uh, conflicts. They now need to be built on. Uh, we can help with that uh, if invited to do so. Um, there is the remaining conflict in Kachin State, which we are very concerned about, um, which, co which uh, involves continued abuse of human rights and, of course, continued violence. Uh, so that has to be addressed as well. But we recognize that um, a very serious effort has been made in this regard uh, by the government in Burma, and uh, therefore it's because progress has been made on all those things that we were able this week to suspend the European Union sanctions. But we will continue to play that, what I think all around is a helpful role. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Geraldine Nord asks about Britain's natural alliance with Australia and how that might be enhanced. And is, that, is it just a matter of uh, enhancing the economic relationship or are there other aspects to this? Uh, it is more than an economic uh, relationship. Oh, Britain and Australia are particularly... Uh close partners, close cousins uh, in so many ways. And so I've, I've already visited Australia twice and I'm planning my third visit as Foreign Secretary. Although no British Foreign Secretary had been to Australia for 17 years until I arrived there uh, last year. We are now putting that right in uh, spectacular mm -hmm. form. Um, and um, we, our foreign and defense ministers uh, meet together on a regular uh, regular basis. So it does include security cooperation and, uh, and I uh, point out again that these days security cooperation uh, does involve sometimes physical assets of our troops working together and of course in, in Afghanistan uh, the UK and Australia are 
partners working together, but it also involves uh, combating some of the new threats. Um, we have a very strong intelligence relationship with Australia. Um, we work together, we've started our work together on combating cyber crime and cyber attacks that I mentioned earlier. So it takes more than an economic uh, form. And clearly our, our ties with Australia and New Zealand are very special, but we're adding to them in these new ways. Thank you very much. Um, we, are, we are now uh, approaching our, our time limit, so it's, uh, it, it, it's a, a sad duty to say that I need to, to bring this uh, second IISS Fullerton lecture to a close. First of all, though, Secretary of State, I, I would like to offer our most sincere gratitude to you for your first-class address on Britain in Asia, and for answering so deftly and with frankness um, all those questions that were posed by our audience and also those questions that, that came through by Twitter. Um, so thank you, Secretary of State, for um, an excellent lecture. Um, we, we wish you well as you continue your, your travels in Asia. I know that you are uh, flying to Brunei later this evening. So thank you very much. Um, could I ask uh, members of the audience to please uh, remain in your seats and, until the Secretary of State has, has left the room? Thank you very much.